file count or files with license. That count wasn't quite descriptive enough. Um, so like Apache 2.0, there's 1,600 yeah. files that have Apache 2.0. Right, right. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, OK. But other than that, I think it's um, exactly what we were talking about the last time. It looks great. So thanks, Matt Snell, for getting that in. And there'll be some additional things once I merge the latest pull request from him. And Matt, are, when are we switching over to the SPDX links? Um, we have the, so there's a listing under the SPDX API if you call all the licenses. Uh -huh. There's a, a kind of like a see this link to, for more information about the license. And yeah. I, took all, I took the API call and I matched them out. So each one of those links that you click when you click the license itself is what SPDX recommends you see when you look for that license. Okay, really? Um... I see. So it's taking me for Apache. It's taking me directly to the Apache.org link. Yeah. I think I think there was. Let's see. So does Apache does uh, SPX not have a flat BSD license? They only have BSD two and three and four. Yeah, they only for specific names, short names for the licenses. Okay. I think the BSD just represents general BSD, which I was not sure what to do about that. Okay. There, there are a lot of pretty non-descriptive parts there that um, that it, it pulls information and it says maybe dual license or public domain or C file. I think those are still important to have, but maybe in another category, I'm not sure. Okay. That's for the future though. Sounds good. Uh, I don't think we have any updates on the license compliance summit. It looks like I'll be going to that and presenting some of the work that we're doing in this working group as well as with Augur. Um, we had an action item to start the CII metric development. And I don't know if I noted where that was coming from. Was I going to do that CI metric? In terms of like building it out? Yeah, it says start CI metric, but we didn't assign a person to it, so. I've got what I can do built out in that pull request. I, I linked to it as well, number 44. All right, so this can, um... actually let's move this. up here. I don't know if anybody wants to keep taking notes, but I guess I will try to do it here. Um, we don't have this item. That works. So the update on this is new PR. <clears throat> I'm writing notes now as I'm doing the meeting. I'm looking at the PR. Um, okay. So this does not follow the new template. Uh oh. Is that is what Kevin put at the end of the um, comments on the PR? Is that your template as well for um, the new the new template? Yep. Okay, then I can I can put that as an action item for me to fix that by okay. next time. Yep. All right, perfect. And the complexity metric, Matt, I got you the um, structure. And I actually do believe I have it run over. Oops. Premium, let's see here.
Maybe I didn't run it over this repo I thought I did, though. No, apparently not. What are you doing? Um, I, I need to run the, um, the, we have the value worker in place now, so I can give you actual data for okay. Zephyr um, that fits that structure that I sent you. Okay. And I thought I had done that, but apparently I did not. So I will do that Okay. here in the next day or so, because I just have to turn it on basically. All right, and then let's see, next item on the agenda. And so then there's complexity measures for every file in there and some summaries that I'll send you as well. And coming up, I think we talked about risk metrics for safety and security, which we want to have some work done uh, before we meet with Kate, I think in either next, I think it's next week. Okay. As a separate meeting. Oh, yeah. So basically, yeah, like, um, I guess it's 11.11. I'll take that to do because it's my to do. Okay. Um, I guess the only other thing is if we have any other outstanding pull requests that we should look at. License. Yeah, so I have, I've been updating the, to the new templates. Yeah, well, that looks like one to just merge. So we have. Oh, hold it. on, hold on. Before you All do right. that, though. <laughs> merge it. <laughs> merge it. So um, there are a couple of questions that, I mean, we can merge it and then talk about it. So we can talk about it first. I'm cool with that. Basically, let's see. If we look at um, test coverage, mm -hmm. 54. So there's test stuff coverage. in here that if you kind of scroll down, and I can change this. So this goes back to the... There are a lot of images in here. This is the released, this is a released metric, isn't it? It is a release metric. I'm updating it to the new template. I see, okay. Yep, and so there's a lot of stuff in here which is like old Augur data models. So if you look at like... I'm actually looking at the pull request which doesn't display it. Um, we'll go, go into the files changed. Yeah, I'm looking there and it's not like... Uh, how do I, maybe I can, ah, okay. I, I had to click a different button and now I can see it presented. Yeah. I was just looking at straight up markdown. So do you see like under tools providing metric basically is where I'm at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I remember, what I want to do here is if you have an endpoint. To show Augur, the endpoint, yeah. Yep, yeah, because right now, if you take a look at, you can see like row, 43, it's like some old test coverage data model PNG. I'm guessing that's not applicable anymore. It is. Is it even? Yeah, that's the new data model. Is it? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at that. Now we haven't implemented test coverage metrics yet, so it could evolve as we put things into it, but that's sort of the meta level data that gets generated by test coverage tools. Why don't, can you just give me like right now the endpoint for this? No, this, it but you haven't implemented it. No, nobody's implemented test coverage. So this is basically the closest we have to test coverage metrics in the chaos universe right now. So I'm, hes I'm, I go, so I'm hesitant to in any of these metrics Remember we talked about this before to like say Augur provides it 
or Grimoire Lab provides it versus Augur or Grimoire Lab has the potential to provide it. Sure. They're kind of two different things to me. Yeah. So why did, what, are, what are people's thoughts? I mean, my thought would be like, if we're gonna, for the existing metrics, my thought would be to wait until we're, like, because we've got about two months for the next release yet. And I think there'll be tools, I think there'll be tooling developed around some of these metrics, likely both in Grimoire Lab and Augur between now and then. So instead of taking things out of published metrics, I would suggest we just sort of put this on a list of metrics we should revisit or make revisiting already published metrics something that we do later. Now, changing it here won't change what was published. You know I, guess I, mean? the, I think the, it's, it's good, but, like but Matt we said. It, we change it here, though, so presumably that would cascade into what's published. And if there's going to be another edit to it, I guess I'm just looking to keep edits from churning. You know so I mean? changing a metric will not change what is released. Ostensibly, though, it would like if we're going to change it in here, wouldn't we re-release the metric with an update at yes. the next? So, if that's what's going to happen, what I'm suggesting is we wait till we're at a more current point with tooling before we increase the work of the working groups and have them go back and redo the metrics that have already been published. Like, if what we're going to be doing is changing the implementation data, I would say. And it's hard for me to tell reading the thing is if, but if we're going to be changing implementation info, I would say that we want to save that until we're closer to the published date. So we're not churning on these things. That's, that's my biggest concern is that we'll end up yeah, churning. At the moment, I'm the only one that's doing these updates. So, I mean, I need some, I mean, it's not a ton of churn. Matt, did you have a comment? I have more comments, but I want to uh, make sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say it doesn't sound like it would be a much of a change. Um, but I, I look at tools for writing the metric in the first words are Augur has test coverage implemented. And that kind of threw me off. I thought that they were saying that they had it somewhere. It's as a ta yeah, as a table. Yeah, as a table, but that's like, it's a lot different than an endpoint, you know? We could just have yeah. some kind of disclaimer to say like, this hasn't been tooled yet or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. So the thing is we could create an endpoint, but to get data, I think is where the actual work lies. And there's a lot of, like if you're gonna be looking at test coverage across N languages in a repository, I think that's a, that's a complex tooling thing. So I don't think we want to, I guess from my perspective, given that there's different levels of complexity on it. And I'm looking at other stuff, like the reference implementation. Do you copy the statement test coverage and subroutine test coverage info? Uh, not at this point. Because that's deleted, but that's actually really important context for what test coverage is. Like, I don't know if it belongs under reference implementation, but um, making a note that there is a, that we want to have coverage for both statement test coverage and subroutine test coverage as differentiating things. I think that so should It is up above. Be, it is, okay. Maybe I'm. I see, I see. So subroutine test coverage. I mean, part of what I'm doing in okay. the metrics too is there was a lot of, there was a, t not just risk, but across all of them, a ton of redundancy. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the case. I need to, I guess this one, there's, there's a bit of, there's a, I'm trying to read this markdown file and look at what's presented. Well, take a look at it then. I mean, maybe not here, but. Yeah, this one, I think there's, I just want I, a chance to look at this more carefully. Yeah. And I'm, I just, I think that these, maybe we need to decide what tools providing the metric means. 
Because to me, it means that if I install Grimoire Lab or Augur, I have access to this metric. That's just what it means to me. Mm -hmm. it, it's not that it's partly there. Right. And so. Yeah, there, test, test coverage is a really unique case because most there are specialized tools for every language. So the two, like Grimoire Lab and Augur for test coverage, statement test coverage and subroutine test coverage are gonna have three choices. One is to store the output of test tools in some kind of abstracted way, uh, to integrate the test tools directly into themselves or to provide some kind of like data interface for loading, I suppose. In any case, so, so I guess if with test coverage, I, the nature of the problem is more complex because the tools that people use to evaluate test coverage are language specific. And uh, I don't know that a metrics tool would necessarily wrap all that functionality into itself ever. I think that's a good thing to say in the metric too. So I don't want to forestall the inclusion of storing data that's output from these tools as <clears throat> having utility without having to package the tools directly with it. Because in some cases, the tools that people prefer to use are commercial products. So obviously they're never going to be bundled in an open source solution, but people might want to be able to store the data and see that picture. So where, so like, um, so as far as you're concerned, Augur provides this metric. No, I wouldn't say that. I think an endpoint is, is nice. I think endpoint is a good boundary, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily solve all the questions that you have about what an implementation means. And I think when you're talking about test coverage, it's a, it's a very unique case. Like in general, I would say that Augur or Grimoire Lab would need to be able to accumulate the data for a metric on their own without, and then that would be, you know, sort of if you have an endpoint, that's the implication. Mm -hmm. I think in the case of test coverage, we haven't gotten, and I don't think Grimoire Lab's gotten deep into how we were, how we're going to include this in our tooling. And I, the evaluate, the initial work that I've done tells me that and the conversations I've had indicate that there are commercial tools, language specific tools. And so test coverage, it, it could in some cases be narrow um, to like some subset of the languages included in the project that are considered most significant. And in other cases, we might not be able to include test coverage like test coverage could be very sophisticated, like in a real time operating system um, C program, because which compiler you use and which header libraries you use are going to be a factor in addition to the open source software that's included. So the parameters of compilation are gonna have an effect on the outcomes of the tests in some cases. And so they're, they're and this, this, there could be some really detailed information that needs to be shared in order for the test coverage metrics to be meaningful. And I think there are, like in the case of real-time operating C stuff, I think there's some important parameters that people need to see. So in terms of Augur providing this metric, mm -hmm. like what, <laughs> I'm just trying to, like- Yeah, I, I mean, my- the goal, can I the, say it or can I not say it? Because I mean, these metrics, what we're trying to do with these templates is not provide like this long extensive narrative that we're trying to say that here's how we describe it. Here's what the objective of measuring test coverage would be. Here are some ways you could filter on test coverage, say over time or over code file. And I here think, are tools that provide insight into test coverage. Right. So I think with test coverage, you're, we're going to have a challenge balancing simplicity and coherent language with the complexity of the problem space. 
that that in this specific case there's a tension there that is different than most of almost all of the other metrics that we're dealing with and this metric's important because of its impact in real-time operating system and embedded systems so like the principles so like i'm agreeing with the principles that you're trying to apply broadly across chaos yeah it, test test software testing breaks those principles or it renders the definition of these metrics sort of cute but not very useful so what can we do about tools providing the metric or we just get rid of this metric altogether i mean if it's such an outlier that well, i think it's I think it's an important metric and with tools, we might want to reference language specific tools that are in common use and then talk about how Grimoire Lab or Augur take the output of those tools and make them available in a dashboard type. Okay, so actually using, pointing to the tools that do this work might mm -hmm. be the sensible thing because if you think about it in value, mm -hmm. in the value working group, we have, um, uh, what's that one thing that- Kokomo. Velocity, remember? Right. And okay. we get to the CNCF tool. Right. Which is a tool providing this metric. Mm -hmm. And I think so, we could do the same thing here. So let's just do that. I suggest we remove, at least at this point, Augur. Well, I think, I think we, if there's tools that provide a way for people to store the data from their test runs and then see that coverage information, I think you want that because it's going to pr then present the metric okay, in a so public we'll way that's useful. Class. So it's it's not a it's a tool that will so it's different than providing. It doesn't generate the output that's necessary for the metric to exist, but it stores it. Right, which I think is useful if you want to see a full picture of a of a piece of software. Okay. Okay, I'll fix that. <laughs> Nobody's even fixing it. What's that? I don't even know if it would be called fixing. It's like, here's a long discussion. Um, no, like fixing it in tools providing the metric. Ah, okay. Is that it, this is, I need, this is what I want. I need like concreteness. And I think a yeah. lot of times in tools providing the metric, we were just like a link to Augur or a link to Grimoire Lab. I think you're and right. That's not like, <laughs> that's super vague. It yeah. Like a person, you'd be like, I don't know what that. Sure. I don't know what that means. So I'm trying to get a little concrete, but at the same time, I don't want to get too concrete where we're like showing SQL statements. Right. So that yeah, ends up being really weird because if you so, know, you change yeah. the, and the, the statements irrelevant. So yeah, what's shown with Augur is just this is where you would load the output of one of these tools or many of these tools and we can provide a standard JSON format that you can generate the output in. All right, I'll and load it. Building an endpoint is trivial, but we can do that too. So could you do me a favor then? Yeah. Could you, in terms of like tools that provide test coverage for particular languages? Like, yeah, get you that list. Can you put that list in this pull request? Yep. Yep, making a note here. Okay, you got it? Okay. Okay, the... And then hmm. the other one, license coverage. It's a new template. This looks more straightforward. It's a little bit more straightforward. There was one area, if you look at the implementation, like row hmm. So it's kind of detailed through here about do socks. It is. Ninja two. I don't even know what that mm -hmm. is. But so we that could be simple. I guess when you want implementation, what is it? What is it that we want that to be? Like this is a more typical case. So are you looking for an endpoint? Are you looking for an endpoint instead of how we get the data? 
An endpoint would be, oh, so implementation is the top level heading under which there are filters, visualizations, and tools providing the metric and data collection strategies. Right. So there are those four subheaders under implementation. Filters, visualizations, tools providing the metric. And so we have filters and visualizations in here. And we could have some description under implementation, which is kind of like what's here. That's fine. This is, you said there was a data loading heading or something like that. There's a data collection strategy heading. So I think that this description of the scanner underneath implementation is actually a data collection strategy more so than it's a metric out. It is a metric output as well. So DUSOX or auger SBOM or S auger SPDX is going to generate a file that I think is useful. Yeah. But this is pretty specific. So maybe this is just one strategy on how to do it. Oh yeah. There's many strategies, but ultimately all they're all doing is scanning the file, looking for license headers or declarations. Yep, exactly. Um, no we were using. Right. So this is, and but this, this part that we're showing is not the implementation of getting the data, it's the implementation of generating the data. I'll put that no, under. Am I right become, about that? That's become part of um, Augur SBOM or Augur SPDX now is the name of it. But it's, yeah. been, it's become part of the tool at this point, so. Yeah, that's true. Kind of, one, there's probably a much more elegant way of describing how that happens. I think, I think this one, I mean, yeah. So this is a case where the tools already made, Augur's already made significant changes to how this works and so the description that's here should be changed to reflect the current state of the basically auger spdx is what dusox was and the integration is pretty tight now mm -hmm. yeah um, so I've, I've got i can link to the auger spdx and say um using this tool uh, this is the part of the template that generates the uh, license coverage data and you can see it on auger osshealth.io that kind of stuff should we accept this pull request so that you can then make those modifications, Matt. That's yes. So that. Yeah. that seems like the easiest thing to do because otherwise now we're... I mean, the other option is for me just to get rid of this one and then start over, but... No, but I think there's value added because you're adding the template, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm just going to merge that one. And then Matt Snell, you can fork and pull it and make an update based yeah. on what we actually have now. And Matt... Matt. Yes, sorry, I was putting something in. Um, when you on the under the tools providing the metric. Yes. Can you also, if there's an auger endpoint at all, if that's even a thing for this, can you? Point um, there is. Yes, I, there is. Okay. It's, a, it it gets pulled from the S bomb, but I can make a separate endpoint just to pull that part. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful. Yeah. And then put that under tools providing the metric. Okay. The generic link to Augur. Yeah. yeah. We also have pull request 47, which is add a focus area readme, which I think is approved and everyone loves. So I can just merge that. Yeah. And that leads us with test coverage. And Matt Snell, you were going to make an update to this add GDOC information to CII, right? After our earlier discussion. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, actually, after an earlier discussion today, yeah, I yeah. have to make a bunch of changes to it to make it fit the new schema. But I can do that in the next couple of days. Okay. It doesn't take very long, to be honest with you. Okay. All right. Um, anything else that we have on the agenda, or that people want to talk about in risk? Mm, let's see. Are there? So here. I have a meeting at two that I have to go to. As do I. So I just put a link to the spreadsheet. Yep. So it's maybe just double checking on this. I would say at our next meeting, we should update um, what we're going to do for the spreadsheet because I think we can get the Kokomo okay. uh, model in there and uh, some of the bug age and I mean I think there are things in here that we can produce metrics for that will be helpful but I don't necessarily want to 
make those updates today. Yep, and I, I do think um, that's fine. I do. I think maybe I've been thinking a little bit about the second release. You know, and you know, if we have CII, maybe it, I mean it, all that it really would take, I think, is even just two or three metrics. I don't think this has to be a big quantity of metrics. Right. Is what I'm saying for the second release. So if CII is one and the Kokomo stuff is two, DNI is working on two at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I would like to get some implementations of the testing metrics in, and I guess those are already released. So, um, and I think the we have like I think Augur and Grimoire Lab both have a number of the risk metrics, um, like time of open issues, yep. mailing list traffic, pull request discussion, IRC activity forks. Like these are all metrics that I think we can demonstrate already. Yep. And and we should perhaps <clears throat> just have them implemented. And some of like when I see lines of code and commits, I think those actually might already be implemented in evolution. Mm -hmm. and, and we should create a cross reference. Yep, no, I agree. That's a good yeah. idea. And, and I was talking when in the DNI meeting today, like some of these metrics honestly shouldn't be that hard to write up, like forks. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sometimes a title is basically the description. Yeah, there's not much more to it than that, honestly. No. <laughs> so, so sometimes there's just not a lot of text associated with these metrics, but it's nice to formalize them. So. But like BAME's model, Kokomo model of human labor invested, that'll take a little bit more. Uh, oh, yeah, only because of the mapping to the modern implementations. Yeah, that's it. But some of these are probably pretty straightforward. Okay. Sounds good. I'm just getting the next meeting agenda. I've kind of got a question. Um, I wanted to get a feel for how pe what the risk community thinks of this one. But I was thinking about kind of a metric of license spread, um, where you look at how many licenses someone has, if they have a kind of a monolithic structure of, I have this um, many of, like almost all Apache licenses on my files. But then like there are other ones that uh, are kind of, the coverage is kind of weird and they've got like a, pretty much an even spread of like Apache and BSD and maybe some MIT in there. Uh, I think the ones that have more of a monolithic structure generally seem to be um, bigger repositories. I'm not, I'm not sure um, how I would um, look at We'd have to be able to ignore things like um, Webpack or node modules or things like that to be able to do that. So what is what does spread tell me? Uh, spread tells you um, it's a risk metric of um, how much ratio there is to like the top license versus all the other licenses. And normally it's a pretty high number, like a pretty small ratio. Um, so it's basically like, taking those counts that you have and putting them into a number. Exactly, like some kind of index. Yeah, so we have the data, so we could develop that metric. Could you do it just a pie chart like that? I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, that'd that would be lend its, ideal. That would lend itself to pie charting pretty well. Would this be uh, at the file level? Uh, yeah, so when we have the license scans like you see on the OSS Health page that Sean was showing earlier. Uh, it, we have a count of every license based on their file declar like their license declarations in the files. Mm -hmm. and we're doing our best to like avoid the um, imported repositories or whatever, but some of them still get in there. So I think we'd have to fix that a little bit before we do this as a pie chart. So then if it is a visualization of the metric we already have. We don't have the metric. Oh, we don't have no. a number of. No, uh, we sort of, we, we in between have it. Because we don't have the spread. So Matt's talking about a license uh, metric called spread, license spread. And so we don't have that, I don't think. And I, yeah. I think it would be supplementary to the visualization really more than anything else. So maybe call the visualization license spread. Okay. I, I, I like the idea. I'm just trying to figure out if it's a separate metric or a visualization on an Or is it on the license coverage metric? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, an, it's something that I guess we'll figure out while implementing it, I guess. 
Take, yeah, take a look at the license coverage. I think one of the central questions there, and I know this is off the top of my head, but was how many of the files do have licenses declared versus don't. Um, that, that was the intention of coverage. Spread, spread is kind of saying how many, how much, what is the density of each license type, which is what we were getting at with the enumeration of accounts. Yes, and it's and kind sort of implicit of an, with the accounts right now. Yeah, so I suppose it could be a filter and a visualization on license coverage. That makes sense. My curiosity is if we did that, would the particular value of spread be obscured or absorbed or made difficult to see? Because I think they're both useful. I have another similar question. Mm -hmm. Um, when we talk about license coverage, I was talking with uh, Patrick and Nick from the Open Source Initiative at mm -hmm. Open, Open, and they wanted to know if we had an open source metric, basically uh, license coverage, but checking it against the list of OSI approved licenses. That's effectively what we're doing with the Augur list that Matt created. So do you compare it against the OSI list and give out something like 20% OSI approved licenses? No, oh, we're not we're not actually doing anything like that. I guess the, if that's something people want, it wouldn't be um, hard. So this is a point we where we can cooperate with the OSI on marketing efforts. If we were to implement this as a separate metric, as a filter, as a visualization, whatever, then they are very much interested in spreading the word about. Matt, Matt, Matt Snell, I think, is, does the SPDX license declaration indicate whether or not it's an OSI license? Um, we will look into that now. And maybe see if there's, if the OSI license declaration is there an API or something that you're aware of, Georg? I am not sure. I think if, if there's a way to automatically resolve whether or not a license is OSI, then I mean, we could certainly define it whether or not the tooling supports it. What is the value of an OSI license versus a not OSI license? License list does have OSI approved in a separate column. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Okay, that would sit pretty neatly with the license coverage, I think, then. Just the OSI approval rating of the yeah. um, overall just, licenses. Just so that we can incorporate that in a revision of the metrics, Georg, what would be the, what is the value add for an OSI approved license versus not? Like, what is their, what does their approval mean in the larger universe? In the larger universe, the OSI is the steward of the open source definition. And with the discussion going on about, hey, is this OSI approved or not? Um, I know there are some companies that have guidelines. It has to be an OSI approved license. And for the OSI itself, they just want it as a marketing vehicle. Okay. So those are the thoughts I have on it. I think, I think we should look into what it means and include that meaning in the metric definition for license coverage, Matt, since you're going back and doing that anywhere anyway. Okay. Um, Cause I am curious what the significance of it might be. And I don't, I don't have a. I think with all oh, the. I'm also happy to invite Patrick or Nick to this call so that we can talk about the significance and meaning as we implement it. I think with the uh, with the controversy right now about uh, open core versus open source, uh, it's probably a really good idea to uh, 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 understand what we're saying when we say. Uh, so I'm looking at the um, po I'm looking at the list of popular OSI licenses, and I, I think it pretty clearly it includes MIT, it includes Apache, it includes GNU and BSD. Um, it in Mozilla, it includes all of the most significant, well-recognized actual open source licenses. So it's not excluding anything that I think is 
widely recognized as an open source license. So it sounds like there's some kind of attempt to create sort of fringe open source-ish licenses and call the work open source. Yeah, I think so, that's I think that's the open core conversation. Open core. Yeah. Okay. In case anybody needs a, um, the licenses file, I've got one of the master files. I put it in chat in case anybody needs to refer to that. It was kind of hard to find. <laughs> yeah, so it does have the is OSI approved. I saw it in the table and it's also in the JSON file. So that's good. But interestingly, in the JSON file, I do not see the free software foundation approved. Yeah, but Red Hat has a blog post just ripping open core to shreds. Like, oh yeah, it's it's huge. Oh There's a, a ton of controversy at uh, a oh, lot okay. of conferences I around, get it. Uh, around it. Yeah, I mean, you know, my opinion is open core is not open source, so let's not play pretend. Right, and the based OSI, on my quick googling of it. Yeah, and the OSI is the steward of that open source definition. Yeah, so, so we should. Uh, That's a good suggestion, Georg. We should incorporate this if we can, Matt Snell. And and I do have to run because I have a two o'clock meeting. Yeah. So, okay. um, I will leave you all if you want to talk further, but I have to go. All right. Talk Thank to you. you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.